Many lost video games have been documented in recent years. This kind of documentation is incredibly important for the preservation of video game history. But did all of these lost games actually exist? We've decided to delve into the history of three lost Nintendo games and see if they truly are a lost video game or perhaps just a rumor or misunderstanding that got out of hand. So without further ado, let's get into the games. According to IGN, a game titled Animal Crossing 2 was announced in a Japanese magazine in the early 2000s after the first game's release. It was planned to hit the GameCube, but ended up being cancelled. This isn't the only place with details about Animal Crossing 2, though. The Lost Media Archive, the Animal Crossing Wiki, Game Facts, and lots of other websites and YouTube videos chronicle what they call an unreleased GameCube game and a lost sequel. But while investigating Animal Crossing 2, some of the info we found Found just didn't seem right. Most of these websites and YouTubers show two screenshots from the game's beta, but none of them cite a source for those screenshots. Using reverse image search, we found the first screenshot is actually from Nintendo's official Japanese website, and in reality it's a screenshot of the original Nintendo 64 game that only released in Japan. The second screenshot was first published on a French gaming site called Game Cult in June 2002 and also appears on Nintendo's official Italian website for Animal Crossing 1 on GameCube. In other words, the only two screenshots of this supposed lost sequel are actually screenshots of the first game. Another piece of evidence often shared is this article on a fan site called Game Cubicle, published on Christmas Eve 2002. It says Japanese magazine Famitsu published a list of Nintendo games scheduled to launch in 2003, one of which is Animal Crossing 2. We couldn't find that exact issue of Famitsu, but we really didn't need to because we found a Japanese article published the exact same day, Christmas Eve 2002. They also reposted Famitsu's report of Animal Crossing 2 getting announced for GameCube, but it says both games' titles are tentative. And actually, there was an Animal Crossing game released in 2003 called Animal Forest E+. Let's do a quick historical recap for folks unfamiliar with the series' origins. In Japan, the first game was called Animal Forest and released on Nintendo 64. It was later ported to GameCube with some enhancements, which was called Animal Forest Plus. Then that game eventually got localized for America as Animal Crossing and had lots of new text and even holidays added so it makes sense to Americans. Nintendo was so impressed with the localization, they decided to localize that version back into Japanese and call it Animal Forest E+, which means there were actually three different versions of the original game released in Japan. Animal Forest, Animal Forest Plus, and Animal Forest E+, and it's that last version that released in 2003. So Famitsu Magazine didn't actually announce a sequel, they were announcing E+, which at the time was tentatively titled Animal Forest 2. IGN's page for Animal Crossing Crossing 2 says it was announced in a Japanese magazine. They don't say which magazine, but it's probably safe to assume they mean Famitsu. There's lots of opinions and speculation out there, but the Famitsu announcement and two screenshots are the only sources ever cited, and they're all pretty easily disproven. In fact, if you look on the back end of the Animal Crossing wiki, most of the wiki's contributors believe it's fake and are saying the Animal Crossing 2 page should be deleted. During our research, we also spent some time googling around in Japanese, and we couldn't find any Japanese. Japanese fans talking about Animal Crossing 2. So it seems this whole idea of an unreleased GameCube game was all just a misunderstanding created by English-speaking fans who didn't know what they were seeing. So with all cited evidence proven false, we deem Animal Crossing 2 to be… fake. Next up is F-Zero for Virtual Boy, a game that some fans call G-Zero and others refer to as Zero Racers. According to a number of websites, including the Lost Media Wiki, Unseen64, and a couple of F-Zero wikis, Zero Racers was only shown to the public once, and that was at E3 1996. But we couldn't find any evidence that the game ever made an appearance. We watched old footage, read old magazines, and even spoke to some gaming journalists and one Nintendo staffer who were there, but absolutely no one saw it at E3 1996. So we reached out to Chris Radke, the guy who founded Planet Virtual Boy all the way back in 1999 and still runs it to this day. He told us, In the early days of documenting the Virtual Boy, we believed that Zero Racers had been shown at E3 1996, and at one point that info was on Planet Virtual Boy, but nowadays we know that the game has never been shown at any trade show, and strangely it was never covered in any Japanese magazines. No video footage of Zero Racers exists to my knowledge. 
He told us there's a couple homebrew games hosted on his site, Formula V and Elevated Speed, which are about as close as we're ever gonna get to seeing Zero Racers in action. Truth is, Zero Racers was only ever seen in two issues of Nintendo Power Magazine, the July 1996 issue with this tiny preview, and the August 1996 issue with this much larger preview taking up two full pages. With help from Art of Nintendo Power, we got clearer and higher resolution scans of these magazines than what was available anywhere on the internet, so you can actually read the tiny text for the first time. Those are the screenshots you'll be seeing throughout this video. We should note that a few other magazines from that time period also mentioned G-Zero, but their information and screenshots were just lifted from Nintendo Power, so all screenshots we're using here are directly from the original. The unfortunate truth is that no one's ever seen Zero Racer's gameplay, at least no one outside Nintendo. So with a little help from Planet Virtual Boy, we got in touch with Jim Warnell, a localizer who worked at Nintendo of America for almost two decades. After exchanging a few emails, emails, we had an hour-long Zoom call so Jim could share his story. He told us, As an associate producer, I wrote screen text, manual and package text, oversaw the debug and approval process, liaised with NCL, worked with marketing and advertising, etc. Anything that had to do with the North American launch of a game was my responsibility. G-Zero, later known as Zero Racers, was on my list of projects. Zero Racers was done. We had a complete manual, package, and label done for the game. It went through lot check. It had an ESRB rating. It was complete. He also said the game's title was changed from G-Zero to Zero Racers late in development to avoid confusion with F-Zero. Zero Racers wasn't a subtitle, it was the game's full title, because it wasn't a direct sequel to the SNES original. It was actually a spin-off. Presumably the G and G-Zero and the Zero and Zero Racers are both references to gravity, since instead of cars, this game had spaceships, and all 15 tracks were made of tunnels where you can fly in all four directions. As far as how it sounded, Jim says, from what I can recall, Call, it was like F-Zero in a tube. It wasn't bleep and bloopy, it was very tin and metallic-y. There wasn't background music from what I can remember. Nintendo Power's preview shows four ships, the Falcon, Stingray, Goose, and the Origami, but it never revealed who was inside. According to Jim, the four racers were Captain Falcon, Jody Summer, James McCloud, and an alien that he can't say with 100% certainty, but he's pretty sure was Pico, who piloted the Wild Goose in the original game. Jody Summer wasn't in the previous game, but eventually made her way into F-Zero X on N64. The same can be said for James McCloud, a human character clearly modeled after the father of Fox McCloud from Star Fox. Jim said he didn't have to localize much text for the game itself, as it was a pretty straightforward racer. But there was some story text in the game's manual, just like the SNES original. Jim also told us just how extreme the testing process was back in the 90s, saying, When they were testing people out for Virtual Boy, they had us go through this... Did you ever see the movie Clockwork Orange? The scene where the person's pinned down in the chair and they've got their eyelids open? That was kind of like what Virtual Boy testing was like. They would dilate our pupils, they would have us sit with our heads in this vice type thing, and they would shine light in our pupils. They would have these plastic rods, they would have them just barely touching our eyes, and they would say, okay, no matter what, don't blink for a minute. They put us under just the most bizarre tests, just to make sure, I guess, to make sure the thing was safe to use. They would blow air into our eyes, they would have us play a Virtual Boy test kit for 10 to 15 minutes, then we'd have to rest. Then they dilate our eyes again two or three rounds of these just bizarre, inhumane torture tests just to make sure this thing wouldn't kill me or blind me or whatever. But, um, yeah, it was interesting. It was a pretty harrowing experience, but fortunately things turned out pretty well for Jim since he got to voice the announcer in the series' next game, F-Zero X. You got boost power! Yeah! The final lap! Zero Racers was completely finished, localized into English, had its packaging and manual, and was rated E for everyone by the ESRB. But Nintendo cancelled it along with two other complete games at the very last minute, which Jim attributes to probably wanting to leave the Virtual Boy behind and focus gamers' attention on the upcoming Nintendo 64. Zero Racers wasn't found in the recent Nintendo Giga Leaks, but Jim's confident Nintendo still has it in a vault somewhere and could bring it back anytime. That's probably never gonna happen, but who knows? Maybe we'll see it on Nintendo Switch Online someday. So with first-hand testimony from Nintendo's localizer and an official rating from the ESRB, we rate Zero Racers as 100% real. Now moving on to this video's next lost game.
In November 2016, Eurogamer reported the next Pokémon game would release on Switch the following year and that it would be an enhanced version of Sun and Moon, codenamed Pokémon Stars. The article's author, Eurogamer's deputy editor Tom Phillips, claimed to have several sources for the story, and at least one was saying the Switch edition would add new Pokémon. Fans were excited to hear about the jump to an HD console, and even though it was never stated explicitly by Eurogamer, most assumed Stars would bump up the resolution to at least 720p. Some fans even canceled their plans to buy Sun and Moon on 3DS and just waited for Stars instead. Hype continued to build over the next few months, especially when the Pokémon Company announced a new campaign called Look Upon the Stars, which saw the release of an entire line of Stars-themed merchandise. Series director Junichi Masuda made a tweet starting with the words Pokémon Stars that some fans interpreted as a teaser for things to come. Anticipation peaked in mid-2017 when Amazon UK began selling pre orders for Pokemon Stars. It seemed to just be a placeholder as there was no box art and the release date was January 2030, but that didn't stop it from climbing the sales charts and reaching number 87 on Amazon's best sellers list for PC and video games. Even when Ultra Sun and Moon were announced in June, the Pokemon Company's official website described the games as eventually coming to the Switch. They quickly deleted the Switch reference and put out a statement saying it was just a clerical error, but some fans believed the slip-up was Nintendo accidentally revealing stars earlier than intended. Ultra Sun and Moon were, after all, very similar to how Eurogamer described Pokémon Stars, an expansion of Sun and Moon released in Holiday 2017 with a few new Pokémon. The main difference was that there were two games instead of one, and it was on the 3DS, so to some, a Switch release still seemed likely. But as time passed, it eventually became clear that Pokémon Stars was never coming. One year after his original 2016 article, Eurogamer's Tom Phillips returned with a post-mortem titled, So What Happened With Pokémon Stars? Long story short, he said his sources indicated that Stars' cancellation was primarily a casualty of Nintendo's business strategy. After the failure of the Wii U, Nintendo was originally planning to release three of their biggest IP for Switch Year One, Zelda, Mario, and Pokémon. But plans changed after the Switch exploded in popularity. And the problem wasn't that Nintendo couldn't sell them, it was that they were selling out of them. They couldn't even make make enough switches to keep up with demand. It was no longer necessary to deploy Pokémon as a failsafe. So instead, Ultra Sun and Moon and a few other big titles like Metroid Samus Returns were released throughout 2017 to keep the 3DS on life support in case the Switch couldn't financially carry the company all on its own. Nintendo's official position was that both consoles would continue to coexist, and the Switch wasn't meant as a replacement for the 3DS. That's pretty much always been their public position on new consoles, like when they promoted the DS as a third pillar rather rather than a replacement for the Game Boy Advance. Eurogamer also said an up 3DS port selling for $60 could have made the Switch look bad in its first year, and risking that perception was another factor that led to stars getting cancelled. Understandably, a few fans were pessimistic about Eurogamer's reporting, with some even accusing Eurogamer of just making it all up for clicks. The most prominent critic was Joe Merrick, the webmaster of Pokémon fan site Cerebi, who would later describe Eurogamer's reporting as BS and a fake rumor, and argue with Tom Phillips in his article's comments section. Now with almost five years hindsight, we talked to Joe and asked what he makes of the rumor. He told us he thought Sun and Moon might have been ported to Switch purely for the sake of testing and was never meant to become an actual product for sale. Maybe someone at Nintendo saw it running on Switch in HD, got the wrong idea, and leaked it to Eurogamer. Or maybe, Joe says, Tom's source just made it all up. We'd heard both theories before, and we'd already been in talks with Phillips during this video's production, so we asked if he thinks that might have been what happened. He flatly denied both possibilities, reiterating that Eurogamer doesn't run stories based on a single source, and the typical requirement is three sources at minimum. He wouldn't reveal who his sources were, of course, but he did say they were in professional positions where mistaking a test port for an actual game would have been impossible. To be fair to Tom, the guy has a pretty good track record when it comes to his reporting. He was the first to report on the Switch's design and internal hardware specifications almost three months before they were officially revealed by Nintendo. He was also the first to report on the Super NES Classic, Diablo 3 on Switch, and several other games long before they were announced. Not everything he's written about made their way onto store shelves, like an English localization of Mother 3, but suffice it to say there are a lot of clout chasers in the gaming industry with fake insider info, but Tom isn't one of them. 
He told us he stands by his post-mortem on Pokemon Stars, and for the record, reiterated that the Pokemon Company did originally plan to release an Alola-based game on Switch codenamed Stars in Holiday 2017. Looking back on Tom's original expose, there's a few details worth re-examining with the benefit of hindsight. The first is that his sources reported that Sun, Moon, and Stars were all developed simultaneously. Although work on Stars was paused at one point so Game Freak could focus on finishing up the 3DS titles for their holiday release date. We'd like to point out that Gen 7 removed a lot of the bottom screen functionality and touchscreen features that were used in Gen 6, like the Dex Nav and Player Search System. Sun and Moon did use touch features for mechanics like Pokemon Refresh, but touch could have easily gotten replaced with motion controls, which is exactly what Game Freak did for Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. If they thought Gen 7 would eventually make its way to Switch, that would explain why a lot of those bottom screen and touch features didn't make their way into Sun and Moon, which mostly just used the bottom screen for map and menu navigation. It's also worth noting that Gen 6 offered stereoscopic 3D for Pokemon battles, but Sun and Moon didn't. Tom told us his info on Stars was accurate, but noted that by the time the details got to him, then out to the public, that info may have already been outdated, and Game Freak's plans might have changed before his article was even published. In a later interview, Sun and Moon's director Shigeru Amori said the idea for the Ultra Games started late in Sun and Moon's development, so around mid to late 2016. And in more interviews in the years that followed, Omori and Junichi Masuda revealed that Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee and Sword and Shield entered production at around the same time, when Sun and Moon were wrapping up in 2016. In other words, the development on all three pairs of games began around the same time information about Pokemon Stars made its way to Eurogamer. All of that going down in a short window in 2016 certainly doesn't prove stars ever existed, but it does indicate that Game Freak's plans were being formed, solidified, and possibly changed around at the time. In an attempt to corroborate Tom's reporting, we reached out to about 50 of the developers who worked on Sun and Moon, but unfortunately, we were rebuffed at every turn. Pokemon keeps their people on a pretty tight lockdown, more so even than Nintendo, so NDAs prevented us from getting a single scrap of info either confirming or denying that Pokemon Stars ever existed. There was a lot of smoke, but we can't say conclusively whether or not there was ever a fire, so we're gonna have to rate this one as still just a rumor. As far as we're concerned, the case is still open, but if anyone out there has first-hand knowledge of Pokemon Stars, we ask that you please reach out to us on Twitter. Maybe we can work something out mutually beneficial. We'll keep digging around for info, and hopefully someday we can make a follow-up video and finally put the rumor to rest, one way or another. We thought we were in a good position as a studio to make a, a, a reasonable effort on F-Zero because it hadn't been done for a while, um, you know, the last F-Zero was probably GX. 16 players, um, 16 AI, a course editor, a map editor that you could share with your friends, 60 frames a second on the Switch. Would have been awesome. Still could have been awesome. I wish we could have, could have finished that. With all these rumors about a new F-Zero floating around, we decided to take a dive into the unexplored depths of the series. Some prominent players in the world of F-Zero have been trying to bring back the series for quite some time. Toshihiro Nagashi, the producer of F-Zero GX, THAT'S MY FAVORITE ONE, had some evolutionary ideas as soon as GX was finished. And Nintendo of Europe tried to jumpstart a revival. TWICE! Kinda. And then there's former Nintendo programmer Giles Goddard and the revolutionary prototype his team built for the Switch. What would those F-Zero sequels have been like if they'd crossed the finish line? And why didn't they ever take off from the starting line? Before we get into all that, let's cover a bit of the background info so that we're all on the same track. Nintendo made the original F-Zero on SNES and F-Zero X on Nintendo 64 themselves, along with BS F-Zero Grand Prix 1 and 2 on the 64DD expansion, which were only released in Japan, and also a Virtual Boy spin-off that was completed but locked into a vault, never to be seen by the public. But around the dawn of the GameCube era, Nintendo started making fewer games themselves and relied more on outside studios. Metroid Prime was outsourced to Retro, Star Fox was with Rare and Namco, and even Zelda got lent out to Capcom. We call them collaborations, Miyamoto told NGC Magazine. What Nintendo is doing differently these days is trying to build strong relationships between the game creators at Nintendo and those at other companies. It's not company versus company anymore. Something most of these series had in common was a decline in seals, and F-Zero was sadly no exception. Every new game sold less than the one that came before it, so Nintendo contracted their old rival Sega to take the reins and make a new F-Zero for the GameCube. 
Toshihiro Nagoshi, the creator of the incredibly popular Daytona USA arcade series, was put in charge of development. Even though we'd lost the hardware market, I wanted Nintendo to see how great Sega was as a company, Nagoshi recounted years later. The only thing we needed to admit was that Sega did not have the ability to sell hardware. Ha 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 ha. Miyamoto was involved. He was like a god to me then. Miyamoto was the F-Zero series producer from the very beginning, and he told Nagoshi, you know how to do this, all you need to do is be confident and just do it without hesitation, and the results speak for themselves. When it finally hit store shelves, GX was lauded by critics and fans alike, gathering review scores around 90%. Even Nintendo was impressed at what Nagashi accomplished. After release, they called him up and asked to see the source code because they couldn't figure out how he'd made such an amazing game with the time and budget that they'd given him. Takaya Imamura, longtime series supervisor at Nintendo and creator of Captain Falcon, said, I'm at a loss as to how we can take the franchise further past F-Zero GX. But Nagashi knew he could push the series even farther and wanted to make a sequel. Talking to UK magazine Cube, he said, To tell you the truth, during the programming processes, we did not have time to develop some of the courses I really wanted to implement in the game. Courses I wanted, but could not incorporate into the existing F-Zero game. So yes, there will be further advancements when it comes to the course designing. He went on to say that online play would be really interesting with a randomly generated course system. Some fans complained that GX was too hard, and to them Nagoshi said, and quote, If you feel that you've been tortured, I'm really, really sorry, but that the punishing difficulty was absolutely on purpose. So we could probably expect to see him tough as Neil's gameplay in a Nagoshi-led sequel. He also said that they pushed the cube to its graphical limits, and since F-Zero's never been a yearly franchise, presumably the next one would have had to be for Wii. But despite its critical acclaim, GX barely managed to sell half as many copies as the previous entry, and Nagoshi's ideas for a sequel never became a reality. Later that same year, a 51-episode anime was produced, and Nintendo partnered with Japanese studio Suzak to produce the anime-inspired game GP Legend for the Game Boy Advance. Nintendo was throwing the kitchen sink at F-Zero. You can't say they didn't try at the time, but seals fell even further. The entire series was dubbed into English, but ended up getting cancelled after the 15th episode aired on Fox. Suzak made one more Game Boy Advance game a year later, F-Zero Climax, but seals were so abysmal that Nintendo didn't bother releasing it outside of Japan. That was the death knell for the franchise. It was over. Nagoshi left Sega in 2019 to form his own studio, and to this day he still wants to make a sequel to GX, but it seems Nintendo just isn't interested. Nagoshi wasn't the series' only suitor though. Someone else who wanted to see the world's fastest racer return, and they're gonna come up a couple of times in this video, was Nintendo of Europe. In early 2011, they picked up the phone and called Criterion Games, the guys who spent the last decade cutting their teeth on the Need for Speed and Burnout series. According to Criterion's creative director, Alex Ward, Nintendo of Europe asked me if there was any chance we could do a new F-Zero for them, and if so, could you be ready to show it at E3 in June? Because they were short of games coming to their Wii U hardware. The UK guys were trying to match Western developers with Nintendo-owned intellectual property. When word got out, some news outlets may have oversold the story a little, saying the game almost got made and would have been a Wii U launch title. It wasn't until a few years later that Ward clarified the situation. He said the guy at Nintendo Europe wasn't very high up. Maybe if it was Miyamoto himself, a deal could have been struck, but even if it was Miyamoto, Criterion was 100% owned by EA so the decision would have been up to the corporate types. And besides, Ward's team was already up to their necks making a new need for speed, so it was a bit of an exaggeration to say the Wii U almost launched with the Criterion made F-Zero. After nine years without a new entry, Captain Falcon was becoming better known as that guy who punches in Super Smash Bros., and people started asking Miyamoto why. In 2012, French site Game Cult polled their readers asking what series they missed the most. One of the top results was F-Zero, so they showed Miyamoto and said, Nobody really understands why Nintendo hasn't made a new one since 2004. Is there a chance we can see it come back on Wii U? Miyamoto's eyes opened wide and he said, I'm really pleased to hear their opinion, because since the first episode on SNES, many games have been made but the series has evolved very little. I thought people had grown weary of it. I'd like to say thank you very much and try to win it by playing Nintendo Land's F-Zero minigame. I'm also very curious and I'd like to ask those people, why F-Zero? What do you want that we haven't done before? A few months later at E3, GameSpeed asked a similar question. Mario Kart 8 made a showing, but where was F-Zero? I certainly understand that people want a new F-Zero game, Miyamoto told them. I think where I struggle is that I don't really have a good idea for what's new that we could bring to F-Zero that would really turn it into a great game again. Certainly, I can see how people looking at Mario Kart 8 could see, through the anti-gravity, a connection to F-Zero, but I don't know, at this point, what direction we could go in with a new F-Zero. 
Captain Falcon's creator Imamura said something similar, that F-Zero needed a grand new idea if it was going to make a comeback. Some fans bristled at their comments, new tracks, HD graphics, online play, wasn't that enough? To be fair to Nintendo though, the series had been evolving, better graphics, faster speeds, more cars, but it wasn't enough to keep seals from driving off a cliff. People just weren't buying them. So from that perspective, maybe it was gamers who weren't satisfied with mere evolution. Maybe it really was gonna take a revolution, more on that later. But to better understand F-Zero's past, as well as its future, we need to veer off track real quick and look at how the genres puttered along in its absence. During the 20-year drought, several studios pulled for position to become F-Zero's spiritual successor, with games like Red Art and Formula Fusion. If you're an F-Zero fan, at some point you might have googled something along the lines of, what games can I play like F-Zero? If you did, the top result was probably Fast RMX. Not only was it a Switch exclusive, it was a Switch launch title and was apparently received quite favorably as the next best thing to an actual F-Zero. We asked Fast RMX's designer and programmer, Manfred Lindsner, was that your intention? If Nintendo won't make it, we will? Not exactly. He said the first game on WiiWare started as a prototype of fish swimming around a curvy stream. He made a joke to his team that, and I quote, we could make a game out of it and call it Fish Zero. The joke quickly got serious though, and over the next few minutes, they decided to abandon the fish altogether and make a futuristic racer instead. They eventually made more ambitious sequels for Wii U and Switch, with some help from our old friends at Nintendo of Europe. Lindsner said, yeah, he'd heard the Criterion story. It seems some Nintendo of Europe employees are fans of F-Zero, he told us, adding a little smiley face. After we shared some not-too-exciting prototypes with Nintendo of Europe, they gave us very honest feedback. That was super valuable because we were a bit lost in technical details and they saw better than us the full potential we could reach. They helped us understand how to design tracks and environments that played and felt like we envisioned. We were very happy how the sequels turned out. And of course, we're also very grateful that Nintendo published the Wii U Physical Edition, then allowed and encouraged us to make a launch game for the Nintendo Switch. Linsner made Fast RMX with a team of just 4 guys. It's got 30 tracks, 15 cars, up to 8 players online, and it runs at 60 frames a second in 1080p. Keep those numbers in mind for later. Linsner said he couldn't share exact sales figures with us, but it was the best selling game they ever made, and now 5 years later, it's still selling well each and every week. Another sequel, he told us, is definitely on the cards. Right around the time Fast RMX was racking up high scores, another studio entered the race, but they were determined to make a real F-Zero sequel, Falcon and all. That studio was Chuhai Labs, who needs a little bit of an introduction. Located just on the road from Nintendo HQ in Kyoto, Japan, Chuhai was founded by Giles Goddard, a programmer with a long history at the Big N. Back around 1990, he was the first non-Japanese programmer to ever work at Nintendo, simply put because they couldn't find any Japanese programmers as talented as Giles. He worked on the original Star Fox, Mario 64, Gushin the Giant, and many others, including a 3D Game Boy game called X that only released in Japan. Giles and another British programmer, Dylan Cuthbert, worked in an office separate from the Japanese staff, and Miyamoto used it as a smoking room to brainstorm in. In 2002, Giles left Nintendo to start his own studio, Chuhai Labs, where they continued to collaborate with Nintendo. Like Steel Diver 1 and 2, where Giles was programming director, Miyamoto was producer, and the director was Imamura, who said he made Sub Wars' mission mode to be like F-Zero in slow motion. More recently, Chuhai released the VR spiritual successor to 1080 called Carve Snowboarding, and their newest game was Curse to Golf, which has seen its share of praise. That's a pretty long introduction, but you get the point. Giles is extremely talented, has a long history with Nintendo, and runs his own studio. In 2021, Giles did a Reddit AMA that had 1,300 comments, but we just want to highlight two of them. He said F-Zero was his favorite game on Super Nintendo, but more importantly, revealed that his studio made an F-Zero prototype with ultra-realistic physics. A month later, he sat down for an hour-long interview with Game Explain, during which he spent about one minute talking about that F-Zero prototype. Giles said he'd pitch it to Nintendo, but, and we're quoting here, Nintendo are very wary about using old IP because it's such a huge thing for them to do. It's much easier to go with a new IP than to reuse an old one. We were kind of stuck in a catch-22 working with Nintendo because we'd say to them, we want to do this F-Zero game. Can you give us all this money? And they say, but you don't have enough people. And I'd say, well, if we had the money, we could get the people. So it was forever this kind of ridiculous catch-22 of them wanting us to make a game, us pitching a game, and then them saying, you don't have enough people. We were dying to hear more about it, so we got in touch with them, and it turns out Charles' F-Zero really was revolutionary.
He told us it was super fast, super chaotic, super realistic physics, so it feels like F-Zero, but there's a lot more depth there. It was quite interesting to see what situations you could get the entire race into. You could bump into one car, it would bump into two other cars, and they would bump into the rest of the pack and it would cause an entire pileup. So it was just fun playing around and seeing how badly you could screw up the race. A fresh take on F-Zero would have been really cool. Each car had four jets, and if a car took damage, one jet might fail and the cards start leaning in that direction. If two jets failed, the car would flip over. The demo was made with a team of three. Charles did the programming, another guy did art, and another made some tweaks to Chuhai's custom engine, although they'd obviously need a bigger team to make a full game. Charles went on to explain the more evolutionary aspects. He said, the idea was massive multiplayer. Massive as in 16 human players, 16 AI, so 32 in total. A course editor, map editor you could share with your friends online, and yeah, 60 frames a second on the Switch. So of course we had to ask, can we get some footage of that demo? Um, I'm consulting my legal experts in my head. I think I can because we, Nintendo didn't pay for the, the demo. We made it on our own. It was our own code, our assets, uh, and I have it upstairs. It's it's on my PC. It's just not running on the latest, uh, you know, GFX chips, whatever. Um, so yeah, we could do that. I could do that. Holy shit! <laughs> Needless to say, we were pretty stoked. He also said he'd upload it to the internet so fans could download it and play it for free. Although he wanted a little something for his trouble. No, you don't have to pay for it. I'll do it for free. Oh, shit. Right. For, I don't know, if I, if I get... If I get 5,000 more uh, Twitter followers, I'll make it. Now we were double stoked, and over the next couple of months, we bounced emails back and forth with Chu Hai talking details. Tragically though, the whole thing ended up falling apart over legal concerns. We'll spare you the details, but basically, we all agreed the future of Giles' studio and the games they'll make are far more important and not worth risking just for this YouTube video. But at least we got to hear the story. Most developers keep these kind of things a secret, so no hard feelings. We love you Giles, and everyone should go follow him on Twitter anyway. The dude's a legend. Charles had said the game never got made because of money, so how much is it gonna cost? He said, nowadays? Less than a million dollars, because it doesn't have to be very big, it just has to play really well. You don't need that many programmers. You could probably do it with five people, less than a million for sure. We got the feeling Giles asked Nintendo for more than a million bucks back in those negotiations. To us, a million sounds like a pretty small budget, but Fast RMX was made cheaper than that and with a smaller team. A few tasks would inevitably have to be outsourced, like how Fast RMX contracted an outside composer and voice actor. But Giles has been in the biz since the 80s and has plenty of experience budgeting games at too high. The guy knows what he's talking about. That's a lot of potential financial upside with minimal investment. Giles still has a lot of enthusiasm for the project, but even if it wasn't an official F-Zero title, a lot of fans would still love to see that prototype developed into a full Switch game. We know you're gonna watch this, Giles, so, you know, respectfully, please get back to the negotiating table with Nintendo, or just make a spiritual successor on your own terms. Show us your moves! Show me your moves! Also, follow him here on Twitter, folks. For a long time, there have been rumours out there about a game. Whispers of a partnership with Nintendo that never came to fruition. A venture led by an Activision Blizzard-owned studio involving a new 3D Donkey Kong platformer for the Nintendo Switch. Suggestions of this project, apparently in development at Vicarious Visions, the company who worked on titles such as Skylanders Superchargers and the Crash and Sane trilogy, date all the way back before the reveal of the Switch itself. Fans have hotly debated the authenticity of this game for years, and so I decided it was time to get to the bottom of it. Was Vicarious Visions really planning a new 3D Donkey Kong game? My investigation will take us into the heart of the company and uncover not just the truth behind Donkey Kong, but a number of lost projects using some of Activision's most beloved intellectual properties, including scrap plans for Skylanders, Spyro, and others. <laughs> One of the major sources behind the Donkey Kong rumours is DK Vine, a new site dedicated to the franchise by editor Heil Russell. Heil has chronicled the rumours on podcasts and in articles over the years, and I reached out to him to learn more about what he had been hearing. According to Heil, he first caught wind of the project back in 2018, when a source had dropped hints about it to him, although no concrete details were provided at the time. One year later, he was apparently approached by a developer who told him that Vicarious Visions was the company behind the project. 
From there, he gained further contacts and gathered a considerable amount of intel on the game. In January 2024, Heil penned a retrospective on Donkey Kong history, elaborating on the project, which he said was a 3D platformer called Donkey Kong Freedom. He claimed that it was in the works at Vicarious Visions and was scrapped by the end of 2016, among many other details, which we'll get to. This is not the first time someone has written up rumours like these. One year earlier, in March 2023, similar suggestions emerged on Famaboards, a forum for discussing Nintendo. The community was debating rumours of a new Donkey Kong game being made for the Nintendo Switch, and a user named Professor Chops chimed in with their take. In their post, they claimed that there was a Donkey Kong game in the works at Nintendo, but it had begun life years earlier as a project at Vicarious Visions in 2016. According to them, it was an open-world 3D platformer and featured Pauline as a playable character. However, in 2018, the project was moved from Vicarious Visions to Nintendo EPD in Tokyo, and its fate has remained unclear ever since. Professor Chops alleged that it was part of an initiative spearheaded by Donkey Kong creator Shigeru Miyamoto to breathe new life into the series. Quote, Behind the scenes, Miyamoto has been championing for a major DK brand revitalization, hence the theme park expansion and rumored spin-off film. He wants DK to be an A-tier franchise again, and he was reportedly behind the push to bring the franchise home and develop it internally. They also took the opportunity to take a few shots at a fellow sharer of rumours named Zippo, who claimed in 2022 that a new Donkey Kong game had completed development at Nintendo's headquarters. Here's what Chops had to say about that. Quote, Don't believe a word he says about DK or anything else. EPD is more secure than the Pentagon. The only reason we know about this game is because of Western sources who were involved in the cancelled Vicarious Visions project. A few weeks later, Zippo fired back at Professor Chops, claiming that the premise of their post was false. Quote, There's another alleged report coming from some literal Who Famaboards poster with no track record who goes by Professor Chops. They go on to claim that Vicarious Visions was at one point making a Donkey Kong game. I'm sure you've already figured this out, but this is complete and utter bollocks. Nothing about this makes any sense. The timeline does not remotely line up. If this was common knowledge to insiders and people with knowledge on the situation, it would be out there. Around this same time, over on YouTube, a Nintendo news channel called Nintendo Prime hosted a podcast discussing the rumours shared by Professor Chops and claimed that he had personally seen footage of the Donkey Kong Freedom game himself. In the aftermath of this and mounting scepticism against their information about the project, Professor Chops posted the following on Famabots. The Vicarious Visions Donkey Kong game was definitely real, and I stand by all of the details I shared. But the details I shared are now being conflated with other more tenuous claims that I cannot independently verify. Furthermore, YouTubers like Nintendo Prime are dubiously claiming to have seen footage of the game, which I don't believe for a second. Nintendo Prime replied to the thread, offering some more details on how he apparently gained access to the footage from the game. Quote, The 40 seconds of footage was shared with me via a video call with a particular person. It was as I described on my podcast. Of note, the footage wasn't full screen and small, and I said that on my show. Having seen a smidge of credibility behind the VV involvement, I was willing to make that one video. The video stuff, the 40 seconds, I was never sure if that was real. It was a different source than the journalist who responded and unfortunately a quick one-time look wasn't enough for me to verify it. The reason I believed it may be real is this person also provided evidence, images, from the VV offices." End quote. Ultimately, no proof of this footage was provided, and discussion around the project fizzled out until DK Vine's article in early 2024. I bring up a lot of this infighting to highlight the amount of impassioned discussion there has been over this subject. Many people believed it was real, many did not. Some have even claimed to have seen it. One person who goes by Gothic Teddy Bear was so fascinated by the rumours that he created his own game and dreams based upon them. 
As for myself, I was skeptical of elements of the tale, such as the notion of the project being transferred over from Vicarious Visions to Nintendo. It is very rare that anything like this ever happens at Nintendo, which is very independent with their own design philosophies and styles. The suggestion that they would pick up the baton from a western studio in this fashion and continue it at their HQ is something that I found difficult to believe. If Nintendo wanted to make a new game in a franchise, they would do it and make it their own. Even in the rare instance of them reassigning development duties from one studio to another, such as in the case of Metroid Prime 4, the project was restarted from scratch. It was also the fact that no visual material had leaked from the project and no big game news sites had covered it. There were aspects of the rumour like these that left me unconvinced, so I wanted to find out for myself how true it really was. What followed was a lot of digging into Vicarious Visions and its history, which plays a role in understanding what happened. Vicarious Visions was founded in 1990 by teenage brothers Guha and Karthik Bala in their parents' basement. For the first years of the company's life, it began as a scrappy upstart where the two taught themselves to code and absorbed as much video game culture as they could from the latest releases and magazines like Nintendo Power. Fueled by a genuine passion for the medium, Vicarious Vision steadily grew into a legitimate business making games for PC and eventually Nintendo platforms. This included their first partnership with Activision, a Spider-Man 2D platformer for the Game Boy Color. The company would come to wider prominence, however, with their work on the Game Boy Advance. They produced an ambitious GBA version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, which utilised innovative techniques mixing 2D and 3D assets to create an isometric 3D skateboarding game. It was released to widespread acclaim, with critics praising it as a technically impressive and faithful conversion of the original title. From there, Vicarious would go on to translate other well-known franchises to the handheld, including Jet Set Radio, Crash Bandicoot, and Spyro. The Barla brothers strongly rejected the notion of doing watered-down ports in favour of doing something more ambitious, and it was this ethos that would lead to their continued success and eventually Activision buying the company out in 2005. According to Guha Baller, they accepted the acquisition out of a need to have access to bigger budgets and more resources. Vicarious Visions would go on to prove themselves a valuable pillar of the Activision portfolio, helping to develop a number of successful titles in the Guitar Hero series. As the 2010s dawned, however, the plastic guitar craze began to lose steam. A highly experimental Guitar Hero 7 was in the works at Vicarious, which included a new guitar peripheral with strings, but was shut down by Activision amid a sharp drop in sales for the series. The studio would instead pivot towards working on another burgeoning trend. Fellow Activision subsidiary Toys for Bob developed Skylander's Spyro's Adventure, and Vicarious Visions was tasked with creating a Nintendo 3DS version. Part reimagining of Spyro the Dragon, part brand new franchise, Skylanders combined action figures with NFC technology, allowing players to summon their toys in the game. While Activision was enthusiastic about the new concept, they set about trying to find a publishing partner to offset as much financial risk as possible. Toys for Bob therefore pitched the game to Nintendo, who was apparently impressed by the technology, but ultimately declined to be a part of the venture. Vicarious Visions, on the other hand, was in on the ground floor of this new idea, and helped to develop each successive game in what would go on to be a massively successful series grossing billions. Led as ever by the two men who founded them, the company continued to be at the forefront of innovation. Nintendo, meanwhile, having missed out on a huge opportunity, gradually came back to the bargaining table over Skylanders. As the series began to take off, talks resumed between them and Activision over including Nintendo characters in the series, but according to then Nintendo of America president Reggie fils it wasn't until 2014 that these talks grew more serious. At E3 that year, Nintendo introduced their take on Toys to Life with Amiibo, and Vicarious Visions saw their opportunity to finally make the discussed Nintendo Skylanders crossover a reality. With Vicarious leading development on the next Skylanders, they submitted a proposal to Nintendo to bring their characters to the series. The Barla brothers, Karthik and Guha, had long since been huge Nintendo fans, and this was not even their first attempt to use Nintendo's icons in one of their games. 
Back in 2006, they were developing the Wii version of Marvel Ultimate Alliance and tried to partner with Nintendo to add Link from The Legend of Zelda and Metroid Samus Aran to the roster of playable characters. A demo was developed for these proposed platform exclusive heroes, but Nintendo turned down the idea. Years later, they hoped that this time they would be more receptive. According to a source familiar with the Skylanders negotiations, they initially asked to use minor Mario enemies such as Dry Bones as playable characters, reasoning that they would fit within the Skylanders world, but to their surprise, Nintendo encouraged them to think bigger and be more ambitious. This would ultimately lead to both Bowser and Donkey Kong joining 2015's Skylanders Superchargers, complete with their own Skylanders figures, which also functioned as amiibo. The Ballers already had connections with Nintendo at this point. They met Reggie fils for example, before he was even at the company, back when he was working for VH1 in the early 2000s. Collaborating with Nintendo on Skylanders Superchargers, however, enabled them to forge deeper connections with the game giant. By all accounts, Nintendo was pleased with how the game turned out when it was finished in late 2015, and it's around this point in the timeline that the Donkey Kong rumours finally come into play. According to DK Vine, one of the primary sources for a lot of the information, Vicarious Vision started work on their Donkey Kong game sometime after Skylanders Superchargers. Up until that point, Texas-based Retro Studios had generally been regarded as the custodians of Donkey Kong throughout this era, as they developed Donkey Kong Country Returns and its Wii U sequel, Tropical Freeze. However, they had since moved on to other projects. Here's how DK Vine's article described this dynamic as they understood it. Quote, With Retro Studios fully occupied and desperately trying to salvage their current project, Nintendo gave Metroid Prime 4 to Bandai Namco and awarded the next Donkey Kong game to Vicarious Visions, Superchargers having served as their quiet audition. End quote. The article didn't give an exact timeline of when it was apparently in the works, but it was enough to go on. I reached out to as many people as I could who worked at the studio around this time. Initially, a couple of people responded and claimed they had no recollection of such a project. Then, I finally began to reach people who did. I remained skeptical throughout this entire process and wanted to prove to myself that this project was definitely real, and so I ended up speaking to not just one or two, but around a dozen different people who vouched for its existence. At this point, I can say without a doubt that Vicarious Visions did work on a Donkey Kong project, as DK Vine claimed. However, there are aspects of the story that they and others have told that after having spoken to so many different people about it, I don't entirely agree with. The DK Vine article, for instance, asserted that Donkey Kong was awarded to Vicarious Visions, and even that Skylanders Superchargers served as an audition for it. In my research, I was never able to substantiate that claim. In fact, I was told the opposite. Nintendo did not approach Vicarious to do a new Donkey Kong game. It was the other way around. This was an unsolicited pitch by Vicarious Visions to get a new game into development. Here's my understanding of what happened. As development wrapped on Skylanders Superchargers in late 2015, Vicarious Visions was mapping out the future of the studio and had a few different projects that they were experimenting with. One of these was a remastered collection of the original Crash Bandicoot games that they had been quietly planning since the start of 2015. Then there was the matter of Skylanders. While Toys for Bob was busy as the primary developer on the immediate next Skylanders game called Imaginators that would release in late 2016, Vicarious was already formulating ideas for a Skylanders 7 that would follow on from it. In the background of all this, the two founders of the studio, Karthik and Guha Bala, decided that it was time for them to make their move. They had built a strong relationship with Nintendo, and they wanted to seize their chance to work with them even more closely. Several former workers shared the very same story. One day in late 2015, a series of walls was erected in the open plan office at Vicarious Visions, sectioning off a portion of the building. This makeshift secret area was off limits to all but a small selection of employees. It even had a door locked with a keypad requiring a password to enter it, leaving some people puzzled and trying to figure out what kind of project could have possibly been afforded such a high level of secrecy. The truth was that behind these walls, they were creating a pitch for a new Donkey Kong game led by Karthik and Guha Bala. 
The project consisted of concept art and a prototype being targeted to run on the next Nintendo console. Following their partnership with Nintendo on Superchargers, the studio had been handpicked to be one of the earliest third-party developers to receive Nintendo Switch development kits, and the two founders were keen to create something unique for it. What was devised was in many ways a culmination of their experiences over the years at Vicarious Visions. It was a demo for a new 3D Donkey Kong game set on a large open island, which placed an emphasis on character movement and flow. Donkey Kong could climb walls and swing on vines, but it also introduced a key new mechanic to his repertoire, grinding. Calling upon their past work on Tony Hawk and Jet Set Radio, the player could grind over horizontal and sloped vines positioned throughout the world. Players were intended to seamlessly string these moves together, creating a sense of rhythm, momentum and flow that one developer said pulled from their experience with Guitar Hero. I am not the first person to discuss the vine grinding mechanic. In fact, it was originally mentioned in DK Vines piece. I can corroborate that it was indeed a part of the demo. Something that I wasn't able to corroborate on the other hand are the article's assertions that Donkey Kong creator Shigeru Miyamoto was heavily involved in the project, which included a very specific anecdote. According to DK Vine, they heard that Miyamoto was in close communication with the team and expressed the following apprehensions about the vine grinding mechanic. Quote, he was greatly concerned about Donkey Kong getting rope burns on his feet. He told the team that he was worried about DK's bare soles, so the team figured out a workaround. DK would wear banana peels as makeshift shoes whenever he would grind. Miyamoto loved it, and it became a key component of the game's visual identity. I did speak to developers who confirmed that Donkey Kong did use banana peels in this manner, but DK Vine remains the sole source for any Miyamoto connection. Out of the people I spoke with, none had any knowledge of him being directly involved, although some did believe it was possible he could have at least given feedback on it. According to some sources, the Baller brothers paid semi-regular visits to Nintendo's headquarters in Japan, and years earlier Miyamoto gave a talk to Vicarious Vision staff, so there was at least a relationship between the two parties. DK Vine's article, along with some of the other sources that shared info about the project over the years, have provided a number of other details that I was not able to substantiate. One recurring rumour tells that Pauline was intended to be featured as a playable character, possibly with stealth gameplay depending on who you ask, but out of the many people I spoke to, none could recall anything like that. The same applies for suggestions that they were planning a story that involved Donkey Kong's home being polluted by some ecological disaster. As it was described to me by multiple former staff, this was an experimental early prototype with some art that was worked on by a very small team. They were focused on nailing the feel of Donkey Kong's movement as he traversed the world. This leads me to believe that a lot of the finer details some have shared may have been embellished over the years. The name of the project is a good example of this. For a long time, fans have commonly referred to it as Donkey Kong Freedom, but to my knowledge, there was no game called this. The project did not have a working title, and it is rare for companies to try to establish one at such an early phase, when that would be something Thing determined later as other parties get involved like marketing people, not to mention the fact that in this case they were trying desperately to keep it under wraps. The project was however given a codename, which was Freedom, and this is where a lot of the confusion appears to have come from. At some point it appears to have been conflated as a possible subtitle for a new game, when in fact it was simply a codename. One of my points of scepticism early on in this investigation was the lack of visual material that had leaked online, but that can be easily explained by understanding the top secret nature of the project and that less than 10 people worked on it. While I wasn't able to find anyone who had preserved anything from the project, which is understandable given how confidential it was supposed to be, numerous people did describe its art style as being a far cry from your typical Donkey Kong game. As opposed to following Nintendo's usual portrayal of the character, or even their own as seen in Superchargers, Freedom reimagined DK with exaggerated proportions, huge arms and small legs. One former worker even described the visual design as Burton-esque. Another said it was, quote, a huge swing artistically, and likely way too far for Nintendo. 
Despite Vicarious Visions attempting to take Donkey Kong in a bold new direction visually, it was in actuality well received by Nintendo when it was shown to them by all accounts. A through line between the conversations I had with former workers was that they had all heard that Nintendo had given them some positive feedback on their demo. In total, it was worked on for a little over six months, starting from around the end of development on Skylanders Superchargers in September 2015. Some developers say that Nintendo's interest in the project was genuine and that it was gaining momentum behind the scenes, until a few months into 2016. As I mentioned earlier, Vicarious Visions had been setting up several new projects, including Crash Bandicoot, a new Skylanders game, and Freedom. Within a relatively short space of time, all but one of these projects would be called. One of the biggest endeavours in the firing line was Skylanders. A group of people at Vicarious Visions had been planning what could have been the most ambitious entry in the series yet, which was codenamed Prism. A demo had been assembled for an open-world Skylanders game set on a large island that was poised to fundamentally shake the series up from a level design perspective. Developers were working on streaming tech that allowed them to stitch together different environments into one seamless world players could explore. Plans for a new online multiplayer mode were in motion as well, which was based around collecting items and bringing them to your team's goal, a setup one developer likened to Crash Team Rumble. They'd also drawn designs for a new line of Skylanders toys that would have brought a fresh dynamic to the games. These would have had two RFID chips in their base as opposed to just one, allowing players to switch between more than one character or form using one figure by twisting it. The idea was heavily inspired by the Skylanders amiibo hybrids they had made with Nintendo that worked similarly. However, by 2016, the Skylanders series was in decline. Skylanders Superchargers, despite being well received, failed to meet Activision's sales targets. During a February 2016 investors briefing, they said the following. Activision Publishing's casual titles, namely Q3 release Skylanders Superchargers and Q4 release Guitar Hero Live, performed weaker than expected, we believe due to greater competition in the toys to life genre and due to the casual audience's shift to mobile devices. In response to this, they shot down Vicarious' concepts for Skylanders 7, otherwise known as Prism. Skylanders Imaginators by Toys for Bob would later release in October 2016, which continued the downward trajectory of the series financially and marked the final nail in its coffin. Vicarious Visions, however, was not willing to give up on some of their ideas for the Prism project and chose to reboot it as an original property. Namely, they wanted to retain their multiplayer concept and rework it into a new IP about a league of various archetypal supervillains vying for supremacy. It would retain the Prism codename throughout this phase. Concept art was produced and a demo was in the middle of being assembled when Activision once again stepped in and shut it down. Developers likened the style of the game to Overwatch, but told me that they had yet to settle on either third or first person for the perspective it would adopt. Lastly was the matter of Donkey Kong, which had made some progress by the end, but still only existed in the form of an early demo. According to some sources, it never advanced beyond grey boxed environments, although the setting the team had aimed for in their prototype was a jungle infested cityscape. Players would start at the bottom of the city running along the ground. To build further momentum, they would need to interact with the environment by, for instance, swinging or grinding on vines, wall running, or bouncing on objects like mushrooms or store awnings a la Super Mario Sunshine. By stylishly chaining these moves together without falling, the player would build up speed, enabling them to scale to higher areas. Internally, their work had received plenty of positive buzz, and word went around the offices that Nintendo had signalled their approval of how it was progressing, although no final decision had been made on their behalf. The only party that definitely wasn't interested in moving forward with it, crucially, was Activision. Times were changing at the publisher, whose leadership decided that they would start moving away from having a diverse lineup of titles from across various genres, producing fewer single-player games in particular. Instead, they intended to focus on no more than a few franchise juggernauts like Call of Duty. Activision's plan for Vicarious Visions was to ultimately transition them into becoming a support studio focused on supplementing these franchises and cutting back on the amount of projects they would produce in-house. This, they had deemed, would be a better use of their resources from a financial perspective. 
Even the opportunity to work with Nintendo on an IP as well known as Donkey Kong was not enough to dissuade them from their plan. Activision's management could not be convinced by the ballers to give it the green light, and it was scrapped towards the start of spring 2016. They instead planned for Vicarious Visions to provide supplemental work on Destiny and Call of Duty. One developer offered the following explanation as to some of the issues Activision had identified with a potential Nintendo collaboration. Quote, If we went with the DK project, it was a riskier move. If they or Nintendo decided to pull the plug on it down the road, we might have had to scramble to find enough work to keep the studio afloat without layoffs. The singular exception to this change in direction for the studio was the Crash Bandicoot Insane trilogy, which remained in development. This was for a range of different factors, according to former workers. For one, Activision was interested in creating remasters of older games after witnessing the success of similar projects from other publishers that generation. They viewed cost-effective re-releases like this as lower risk compared to producing a fully new game. Sweetening the deal even more was the fact that they had been able to court a deal with Sony to release it on the PlayStation 4 as a timed exclusive, further mitigating financial risk. This, in essence, is why the Crash Insane trilogy was made. According to some ex-developers, despite growing fan demand at the time, Activision was initially reluctant to do anything with Crash Bandicoot and took months of convincing that even a remaster would be worth investing in. Activision ending the Freedom Project and making known their intentions for Vicarious Visions was the last straw for the two men who founded the company. On the 4th of April 2016, the Baller Brothers announced that they were leaving Vicarious Visions to start a new game business not far from them in Albany. They would go on to found Velen Studios in November 2016 and began producing their own original games. In the years since, the duo have been coy about the reasoning behind their departure, saying little more than that they wanted to take on a new challenge. In November 2016, they told VentureBeat, Emotionally, it was very challenging to leave. It's been our growth from childhood to adulthood. There are amazingly talented folks there. I asked a variety of different people who worked at Vicarious at the time about what inspired the two founders to leave behind the company they created. The consensus was that Activision and the Baller Brothers were at odds with each other philosophically. The Ballers wanted to keep creating original games, while Activision wanted Vicarious to provide additional work on franchises helmed by other studios. One person who worked directly alongside the two brothers was senior designer Rob Gallarani. He offered the following comment on what happened. It's well known that the Ballers have always pushed the boundaries of creativity in their games, and Karthik especially is a huge fan of Nintendo. A point of friction always existed between Vicarious Visions and Activision about how risky to be with our games and the projects we took on. As history shows, Activision publishing is basically nothing but Call of Duty at this point. Now I'm hopeful that with the change in leadership with Microsoft they might change that, but at the time none of that was a thing. Ultimately, I expect that this big difference in styles is the largest reason the brothers decided to leave and go do their own thing. And honestly, they have kept true to form if you look at the type of creative titles Velen has released since its founding. One could conclude that Activision had no interest in a not Call of Duty game, and the brothers wanted to, with Nintendo in the middle. Again, I'm not saying that VV ever had a Donkey Kong project, but I can confirm the bit about the brothers wanting to be creative with projects and Activision really having no interest in it." End quote. While neither Karthik or Guha Bala have spoken about any Donkey Kong project or explicitly confirmed any of the aforementioned suggestions about their reasons for leaving, it could be argued that some of their public statements do line up with these sentiments. In 2021, Guha Bala gave an interview to GameIndustry.biz in which he discussed the difference between working for a large publisher like Activision versus going independent. Quote, These firms tend to focus on more predictable franchises or categories, even with new bets they have ready comparables for what the sales would be. So it's either, let's extend more of what we have, or there's a category out there that we want to be in, or here's what's selling, we're going to take market share away from somebody else. They also have a value delivery system that's already pre-established, like mobile games or free-to-play mobile games or premium games. Their entire value system is organized around that. So those are the types of games you're going to be making in those sorts of organizations. What we wanted to do was get out of our comfort zone. On a personal 
personal level, I get very uncomfortable when things seem a little routine, when the future looks totally fine and predictable, so I don't gravitate towards that." End quote. Following the departure of the Barla brothers in April 2016, senior executive producer Jen O'Neill was appointed the new head of Vicarious Visions and would oversee the company as it embarked on a new chapter in its history. While many staff were busy working on Crash Bandicoots, Activision began to implement their plan for Vicarious. The rest of the company was assigned with supplementing development on Destiny 2 and the next Call of Duty game, Infinite Warfare. Their work on Destiny in particular would continue for the next couple of years, an assignment most developers told me they were less than enthusiastic about. Quote, there was some difficulty there due to the relationship being treated like an outsource studio by some people at Bungie and a collaborator by others. It made for a somewhat uneven experience." End quote. A project that Vicarious staff did enjoy developing, on the other hand, was the Crash Insane trilogy, which launched to positive reviews in June 2017 and went on to become a huge commercial success. It dominated UK sales charts for eight consecutive weeks, and in 2019, Activision revealed that it had sold over 10 million copies. Such a positive financial result led many to believe that the studio would be given the leverage to head up more adventurous projects, or perhaps even bring back other beloved franchises, but at least in the immediate aftermath, that was not so. Activision instead had them focus on developing post-launch content for Destiny 2, although that's not to say that Vicarious didn't try to work on their own projects. Following the release of the Crash Insane trilogy, the studio attempted to get a number of other projects into development, one of which involved another mascot of the same era, Spyro the Dragon. In 2018, Vicarious had been contributing to the development of the Spyro Reignited trilogy, a collection of remakes led by Toys for Bob, and developed ambitions of creating their own game in a series. The project was led by studio head Jen O'Neill and presented a new take on the world of Spyro for the modern era. Many years had passed since the events of the original games and Spyro had matured into a fully grown adult dragon. Rather than playing as the hero of the old games, the player controlled their own original dragon character that they would customise with different equipment or by altering features like the colour of their scales. Spyro in this game would have instead served the role of a mentor, teaching the player's younger dragon character the ropes of being a dragon warrior. His design in the game was likened by one former developer to the Guardians from the Legend of Spyro series. Your adventure would have taken place on an ancient island that had mysteriously re-emerged after years of being lost. The player would roam the island, a vast open world, completing missions for Spyro and other characters. They could also team up with the dragons of friends in online co-op to explore the landmass together. The game focused on a combination of exploration and combat that would have taken place both on the ground and in the air. Players would have been able to fly around the island, engaging in dogfights against enemies. Over a number of months, Vicarious Visions developed a prototype for the project and was testing out flight mechanics for the dragons. In an attempt to appeal to Activision, given their shift towards the games-as-a-service model with titles like Destiny 2, the pitch proposed a live-service approach that developers told me was very similar to Destiny itself. An ongoing story and a living world that would evolve over time with new quests and collectibles for players to come across. While there was some enthusiasm internally about the prospect of doing an original project like this, not everyone was on board with this element, such as one developer who said the following. To me, it read as somewhat of a desperate attempt to combine VV's experience with the Spyro IP with Activision's desire for evergreen games. Which wasn't wrong, Activision was basically only interested in games that would live forever and make infinite money. Despite their efforts to appease Activision's fixation on the live service trend, the publisher declined to move forward with their Spyro project, again wanting them to focus on Call of Duty and Destiny 2. Another fad which Activision's higher-ups had become enamoured with was Battle Royale games, namely Fortnite. In response to the rise of titles like these, Activision added a Battle Royale mode to 2018's Call of Duty Black Ops 4, named Blackout. During the making of this mode, the company wanted to get a mobile version of Blackout to release around the same time, and tasked Vicarious Visions with developing it. This would have been a standalone mobile game separate from Call of Duty Mobile that was entirely dedicated to the Battle Royale mode. Recognising that mobile players were integral to Fortnite's success, Activision had hoped to rush it out for phones and tablets, but it was ultimately short-lived. They were unable to expedite its development fast enough to their liking and chose to shelve it in favour of adding Battle Royale to Call of Duty Mobile at a later date. 
Amid these consolations and rejections, morale at Vicarious Visions faced a gradual decline from 2016 onwards, according to former staff, with some even citing the end of the Donkey Kong project specifically as a turning point. Here's what one ex-staffer had to say about the state of the studio at this time. Prior to 2016, we regularly did pitches for games to Activision. We often got budget allocated for staffing and project resources to prepare pitches, even though they were basically all declined by Activision Corporate. Afterward, we rarely made new pitches, and the atmosphere was extremely tense. Very few people actually wanted to work on Destiny 2, and we basically upended our entire studio to work with Bungie. Destiny 2 development was exceedingly miserable for a wide variety of reasons, and it was clear that we would not have the creative freedom or independence that we did previously. Multiple former workers that I spoke to told me that while Activision would allow for teams to create proposals for new games, including demos, this was done more as a creative exercise to keep morale up, rather than out of any genuine intention to let them do anything original. They believed Activision's management understood on some level that the appetite to do supplementary work on their big franchises, the studio's primary assignment at the time, was very low. Quotes, after Donkey Kong got cancelled, the studio heads left and VV switched to a Destiny support studio. Things got worse very quickly. The studio culture took a severe nosedive and we lost a lot of the most talented developers." End quote. In my research, I found that Vicarious did indeed face an exodus of key staffers in the years after the founders left in April 2016, and many of them went to work for the Ballers under their new company, Velen Studios. David Nathaniels was a senior executive producer at Vicarious Visions. He left in July 2016 and joined Velen in December of that year. Jeremy Russo, who served as lead designer on Skylanders Superchargers, left in December 2016 and signed up at Velen four months later. Senior software engineer Joe Morton departed Vicarious the same month and immediately joined Velen. Nicholas Roop was an executive producer at Vicarious. He left the company in January 2018 directly for a job at Velen. There are many more examples of this, but the last one I'll mention is one of the most crucial. Dan Doptis was a senior software engineer at Vicarious who worked specifically as a toy engineer on Skylanders Superchargers, helping develop the Skylanders Amiibo hybrids. He resigned from Vicarious in December 2016 and took a position at Velen immediately after. Using his expertise in toy development, he went on to direct Velen's first ship game, Mario Kart Live Home Circuit for the Nintendo Switch, which released in 2020. This ambitious project involved the player controlling a physical toy of a Mario Kart RC car on their Nintendo Switch, driving the cart around their living space. Finally, after years of striving unsuccessfully to do so under Activision, the Baller Brothers were able to partner with Nintendo on a fully original project, one built upon the type of innovative thinking they had become known for. Vicarious, meanwhile, was slated to supplement more of the same two franchises Activision needed content for. Even when Bungie and Activision eventually split up in January 2019 and Vicarious was relinquished of its Destiny duties, they were still assigned largely to work on Call of Duty. There was, however, an exception to this. After years of unsuccessful pitches, the studio found some respite from its support work when they proposed a new collection of remakes, this time of the original Tony Hawk's Pro Skater titles. For some time, there had been a desire to revive the fondly remembered series, and they found a way to do it that was low risk enough for Activision to fund it by proposing remakes. They would go on to remake the first two games in the series, but according to Vicarious sources, they once considered something far greater in scope. During early discussions on the project, the team initially wanted their remake collection to comprise not just Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, but 3 and 4 as well. Ultimately, this was deemed too ambitious, and the proposal was scaled back to the original two titles. One former developer explained the decision thusly. We settled on adding some handling features from the later games to reflect the way people remember the old THPS games. Some of the improvements from 3 seemed to bleed into people's memories of the first two. Eventually, it became clear that we didn't have time for more than 1 and 2, so the idea that we'd continue on and release 3 and 4 in some fashion was on the table. The notion of carefully and incrementally improving the original games by making them reflect the rose-tinted memories of fans was a philosophy the developers had carried since the days of the Crash Insane trilogy. With that release, for instance, they implemented features from the later games into the original title, such as time trials. 
The Tony Hawk remakes, by all accounts, were a welcome change for Vicarious staff, who had only positive comments about working on them in our exchanges. The collection would go on to release in September 2020 to universal critical acclaim and was a big commercial hit. It became the fastest selling game in the franchise and was cited as a major source of revenue for Activision in their 2020 investors briefing. Around launch, there was a brief flicker of hope that Vicarious Visions would get to fulfil their ambition of revamping Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 and 4, but that soon faded. A pitch for such a project was presented to Activision's head shortly after the first two were finished and they declined to greenlight it, again telling the studio that they wanted them to focus on supplementing their larger franchises. According to Tony Hawk himself, Activision supposedly held talks with their other subsidiaries about producing more games in the series around this time, but those discussions never amounted to anything. One of the major reasons why remakes of 3 and 4 were turned down by their parent company has to do with another project that Vicarious was working on during this period. Alongside the Tony Hawk remakes, the studio co-developed a remaster of Diablo 2 in a collaboration with Blizzard, which Activision had merged with back in 2008. Blizzard was impressed by the technical and production expertise demonstrated by Vicarious during the making of this title, and expressed a desire for them to move over from the Activision side of the business on a permanent basis. They proposed merging Vicarious Visions with Blizzard to work with them more closely, but during initial talks, told them that they could maintain their studio name and potentially continue to make their own projects. In the short term, Blizzard primarily wanted Vicarious' resources to supplement the development of Diablo 2 Resurrected, followed by Diablo 4. This pledge, however, was soon abandoned amid upheaval among the management of Activision Blizzard. In April 2020, Cody Johnson, their chief operating officer who had previously worked as a White House field director under President George W. Bush, stepped down from the role. He was replaced by Daniel Allegra, a former Google executive. Following this shakeup, the prospect of Vicarious Visions maintaining its identity and ability to create its own projects was eventually taken off the table, although workers at the studio were not informed of this plan change in direction for months to come. Even in January 2021, when news of Vicarious merging with Blizzard went public, staff remained under the impression that they would maintain their independence. As the merger was announced, it came with another important shift. Their studio head Jen O'Neill transferred to a new position as EVP of development at Blizzard. Vicarious COO Simon Ebertshire became the new studio head in her absence. He would lead the company through its transitionary period, although as the year went on, these changes would be overshadowed completely by a storm of controversy that had been brewing in the background for years. On July 20th, 2021, the state of California filed a lawsuit against Activision Blizzard, alleging that the company was subject to a culture of rampant sexual misconduct and harassment. It was the result of a two-year investigation by the government that had uncovered a pattern of abusive and often criminal behavior that the management had apparently enabled and at times even encouraged. The lawsuit attempted to force Activision Blizzard to comply with state workforce protections and pay damages to female employees. This was the start of a reckoning the likes of which the publisher had never faced before. In a public statement, Activision Blizzard was initially dismissive of the suit, saying, quote, The Department of Fair Employment and Housing includes distorted and in many cases false descriptions of Blizzard's past. It is this type of irresponsible behavior from unaccountable state bureaucrats that are driving many of the state's best businesses out of California. With time, journalists eventually unearthed a trail of evidence that only substantiated the state's claims against Activision Blizzard. The Wall Street Journal, for instance, uncovered emails, internal memos, and other documents showing that their CEO, Bobby Kotick, had known about many of the allegations made against his staff and failed to act on them, neglecting to inform their board of directors about these incidents. In the days after the lawsuit was filed, however, Activision Blizzard's executives attempted to downplay the allegations. One figure who came to attention during this period was Fran Townsend, another former advisor to President George W. Bush, who was previously known for advocating for and defending widely discredited forms of torture during the Iraq War. Townsend became the subject of controversy after she sent out a company-wide email to Activision Blizzard employees which opened as follows. Everyone. 
As the executive sponsor of the ABK Employee Women's Network and our chief compliance officer, I wanted to reach out to you. A recently filed lawsuit presented a distorted and untrue picture of our company, including factually incorrect, old and out of context stories, some from more than a decade ago. Rather than put out the fire engulfing the company, the email only enraged it. Days later, hundreds of employees organized a walkout in protest, and according to an IGN source, this demonstration was directly inspired by Townsend's inflammatory email. As the controversy blew up, Townsend stepped down from her position at ABK's Employee Women's Network. One year later, she resigned from the company altogether. Days after the email controversy, CEO Bobby Kotick sent out a new company-wide message apologizing for the ongoing issues and labeled Townsend's email as tone deaf. But not everything was as it initially seemed. It later emerged via the Wall Street Journal that Fran Townsend was not the person responsible for writing that email. In fact, it was authored by none other than Bobby Kotick himself, who ordered it to be sent out under Townsend's name. In sharp contrast to this initial defensive messaging from other executives, Blizzard's president, J. Allen Brack, who had held the position since October 2018, after many of the alleged events occurred, sent out his own email with a very different tone. Quote, Hello Blizzard. I personally have a lot of emotions coming out of yesterday, and I know you do too. The allegations of the hurt of current and former employees are extremely troubling. While I can't comment on the specifics of the case as it's an open investigation, what I can say is that the behaviour detailed in the allegations is completely unacceptable. The leadership team and I will be meeting with many of you to answer questions and discuss how we can move forward." End quote. Although, just a couple of weeks later, Brack resigned. In 2021, he revealed to VentureBeat the reasoning behind his decision. Quote, for some time, it had been clear I had differences in vision with Activision Blizzard. Yet, with 16 years at Blizzard, separation was incredibly difficult. But I believe the organization would heal faster under someone new. Following his departure, former Vicarious Vision studio head Jen O'Neill was promoted to co-lead Blizzard in August 2021 alongside Mikey Barra, who had previously served as executive vice president. But just three months later, Jen O'Neill announced that she was leaving the company altogether. Initially, the split seemed somewhat amicable, with O'Neill releasing a statement that read, I'm doing this not because I am without hope for Blizzard, quite the opposite. I'm inspired by the passion of everyone here, working towards meaningful, lasting change with their whole hearts. However, it soon became clear that there was more to the story than this press release had let on. The Wall Street Journal obtained a series of internal emails sent by O'Neill to Activision's legal department, in which she said she'd been sexually harassed and discriminated against throughout her time working at Activision Blizzard, and professed a lack of faith in those running it to fix these issues. In one instance, she recounted attending an Activision studio party with Bobby Kotick, which included scantily clad pole dancers and a DJ who encouraged the women present to drink more than the men. On top of this, the emails revealed that O'Neill had been paid less than her fellow co-president, Mikey Barra, for doing the same job. When O'Neill discovered this and asked to be paid equally, the management of Activision Blizzard, a company worth $51 billion at the time, denied her request. Shortly thereafter, she chose to leave, writing in another message, quote, I have been tokenized, marginalized, and discriminated against. And it was clear that the company would never prioritize our people the right way. Activision Blizzard responded swiftly to these allegations, telling Kotaku that Jen O'Neill was offered equivalent pay. This claim prompted O'Neill to finally break her silence on the matter, setting the record straight in a letter to IGN. Quote, when Mike and I were placed in the same co-lead role, we went into the role with our previous compensation, which was not equivalent. It remained that way for some time, well after we made multiple rejected requests to change it to parity, end quote. She then went on to clarify that Activision Blizzard eventually did offer her an equivalent amount, but only after she handed in her resignation as a last resort to keep her in the company. When asked if this was true by the games press, the publisher stopped responding to their questions. 
This is just one example of many in which the company deliberately attempted to obfuscate the truth in order to save face, while attempting on one hand to deny its alleged widespread mistreatment of women, Activision Blizzard publicly tried to throw two of its most prominent female executives under the bus. Jen O'Neill worked her way up through the organization over the course of nearly two decades, starting out as a producer at Activision before becoming the head of Vicarious Visions and eventually Blizzard. Its leadership thanked her with unequal pay and by attempting to paint her as a liar when it emerged they had done so. After leaving the company, she went on to found her own development studio, Magic Soup Games, with fellow former Blizzard head J. Allen Brack. Vicarious Visions, meanwhile, was notably absent from the onslaught of allegations levelled at members of Activision Blizzard. The subsidiary maintained its name throughout 2021 as they completed ports of the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater remakes and concluded their work on Call of Duty. Most staff there believed that they would continue to maintain their independence and title under Blizzard, but that illusion was abruptly shattered on the 27th of October 2021. Workers were summoned to a Blizzard Town Hall meeting in which their leadership suddenly declared that they would no longer be called Vicarious Visions and that they would cease making their own games. This blindsided most of the developers present who had previously been under the impression that this would not be happening. Over the course of the transition, more employees continued to leave from across all different departments, many of whom joined their former colleagues at Velen Studios. In April 2022, it was announced that the merger had been completed. Vicarious Visions was no more. It was renamed to Blizzard Albany. They permanently switched to becoming a Blizzard support studio, ending their 30-year run of creating games as the lead developer. They would continue development on Diablo 4. Later that year, their quality assurance department launched a bid for unionization in an attempt to secure better working conditions and fairer pay. Activision Blizzard fought the campaign bitterly, attempting to derail it at every stage. The Game Workers Alliance accused them of spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on Reed Smith, a law firm specializing in union avoidance tactics in order to stop the bid. Publicly, Activision Blizzard made the case that unionization would negatively affect pay growth for workers and attempted to delay the vote numerous times. Ultimately, Blizzard Albany's QA team was successful, winning the vote 14-0. Activision Blizzard tried to appeal the results and failed. One year later, the National Labor Relations Board charged the publisher with illegal union busting. They said that workers, quote, faced illegal coercing, intimidation, and silencing by their employer. They went on to say the following. This egregious behavior by Blizzard is yet another example of the company using its platforms and tools to coerce and intimidate workers, exercising their protected right to organize. These actions, coupled with Activision Blizzard's illegal firing of workers speaking out about their working conditions and several other unlawful actions, shows a clear pattern to disregard the law in an attempt to silence workers. The years after the initial lawsuit by the state of California shrouded Activision Blizzard in scandal after scandal, some of which directly implicated its CEO. It emerged that not only was Bobby Kotick allegedly responsible for covering up many of the aforementioned incidents, he had himself harassed a former assistant of his years earlier. This individual sued him, presenting a voicemail as evidence in which Bobby Kotick threatened to have her killed. Kotick later settled out of court for an undisclosed sum. The Wall Street Journal, who uncovered this information, received this comment from Activision, who conceded that all of this was true. Mr. Kotick quickly apologized 16 years ago for the obviously hyperbolic and inappropriate voicemail, and he deeply regrets the exaggeration and tone in his voicemail to this day. The Wall Street Journal later reported that Kotick considered buying games media outlets such as PC Gamer or Kotaku in a bid to influence the narrative about his management of the company. Although Activision Blizzard's board did nothing to stop the embattled CEO and re-elected him for another year in 2022, there are some suggestions that his grip on the company was weakening by this point. On the 18th of January 2022, Microsoft announced their plan to acquire Activision Blizzard for a record sum of $68.7 billion. According to Bloomberg, a source familiar with the process told them that Kotick did not want to approve the buyout initially, but due to his shaky position, he was compelled by the board to accept it. 
Despite the company's repeated protestations, Activision Blizzard settled multiple lawsuits as a result of the allegations against them in 2023. In February of that year, they agreed to pay the Securities and Exchange Commission a fine of $35 million. It was ruled that they had lacked procedures for workers to report misconduct within the company and that they had failed to provide protections for whistleblowers, de-incentivizing people from coming forward. In December 2023, the Californian government's lawsuit against the company came to its conclusion. Activision Blizzard settled the suit for approximately $54 million. A statement from the state's civil rights department said that their management had, quote, discriminated against women at the company, including by denying promotion opportunities and by paying them less than men for doing substantially similar work. The settlement would go towards compensation for those who had been affected between October 2015 and December 2020. One month later, with Microsoft's takeover of Activision Blizzard complete, Bobby Kotick resigned from his position as CEO. In spite of the slew of scandals that plagued his tenure, he was handed a compensation package of around $15 million. This was in addition to his annual salary that peaked at $155 million in 2021, which marked him as the second highest paid CEO in the industry at the time. In the days after his departure, numerous former Activision Blizzard employees came forward with their stories of how Kotick's leadership had negatively impacted them during their time at the company. One of these was ex-Blizzard community manager Andrew Belford, who tweeted the following. Breaking my silence to share a fun fact. When we planned Overwatch 2 Steam launch, my team warned months in advance that we're going to be review bombed. We begged for more information, more details, and more resources to help us with the anticipated influx, all flatly denied. When asked whose decision it was to launch on Steam with no additional help, Bobby. This is only one example of the culture Kotick bred at AB. Shit flowed downstream, usually landing on the lowest paid and most overworked individuals. Management was too busy reacting to widely vacillating direction and decisions that made zero sense. At the end of everything, player experience slash worker meant nothing to C-Suite and exec leadership. It was all about that quarter's earnings call. Bobby Kotick survived for as long as he did at Activision Blizzard for the same reason Vicarious Visions did not, the indomitable success of their major franchises like Call of Duty. The only people capable of threatening his position, the board of directors, did not care about the untold harm he enabled or the maelstrom of bad publicity that resulted from it. The same franchise behemoths delivered year on year, and to them, that was all that mattered. Instead, it fell to journalists to hold them accountable. The work of people at the Wall Street Journal, Kotaku, IGN, Bloomberg, and others brought to light the many injustices that Kotick and his ilk allowed to take place. Now it's left to the public to decide how they want to consider his legacy. As a man who brought financial growth to Activision Blizzard, or as someone who inflicted a culture of misconduct and mistreatment upon his own workers. We never worked on anything, even pitched anything, that would be similar to, like, Breath of the Wild or Ocarina of Time, Wind Waker. We never worked on a game of that format. We never worked on anything that could be called a traditional Zelda. In 2008, a few months after Retro Studios released Metroid Prime 3, rumors started to spread that their next project was a Zelda game for Wii. Interviewers spotted Hylian memorabilia hanging on the walls of Retro HQ, and fans were hyped for what a Western Zelda made in Texas might look like. Retro actually worked on a GameCube launch title called Ravenblade they said was going to be like Ocarina of Time with some twists. Now almost a decade later, hopes were high for Retro's Wii project, but excitement faded as years passed without any official announcements or leaks. In 2012, IGN asked series creator Shigeru Miyamoto if there was any truth to the rumor. Miyamoto said, In terms of them working on a Zelda, it's not out of the question, certainly, for them to work on an entire Zelda game amongst themselves, but they're too busy for that sort of thing right now. It would probably require me to be involved to a great extent as well, so I would have to get over there quite a bit too. I'd probably have to live in Texas. Retro's next game was Donkey Kong Country Returns, and after a while, fans forgot about the Zelda rumors. Well, until 2020, that is, when Metroid fan site Shine Sparkers noticed some of the game's concept art hiding in plain sight. 
Over the past couple years, a former retro artist, Sammy Hall, posted over 100 pieces of art on his ArtStation account, a social media platform similar to DeviantArt. The story quickly went viral, and apparently realizing he shouldn't have posted that stuff online, Sammy immediately deleted all his social media, his personal blog, and basically went into hiding, never to be seen again. However, we managed to get a hold of him with some internet sleuthing, and talked off and on for a couple weeks. It was great talking to Sammy, but he ultimately declined our interview requests. Luckily, however, we were able to grab some info from his old websites before he deleted them a few years ago. We were also able to speak with two other retro employees familiar with the project. One is Paul Tozur, one of the game's two programmers. I feel the statute of limitations has expired on a lot of this because it's 15 years ago, and I'm interested in telling the truth. The other person was only willing to speak as an anonymous source. We know who this person is, and we're able to confirm their identity but we can't share who they are in this video. It's a pretty secretive subject, and as it turns out, Retro Zelda Project was bigger than you probably thought. There's much more than just artwork. There was actually a playable prototype with nine months of work put into it. By the way, make sure to stick around to the end of this video. You're in for a mind-blowing surprise about 15 minutes from now. We're getting ahead of ourselves, though. Before we get into all the new information we dug up, let's start with the art and info that dropped in 2020. We should note that every image used in this video has been digitally upscaled for clarity, and we'll also show the name of all concept art in the bottom corner. We acquired these image names by downloading the concept art directly from Sammy's art station, which are worth some attention because they reveal some clues. For example, these pieces are called Rhino Sketches, and this location artwork's called Rhino Land, which suggests they go together, with the rhinos living in or around the city. On his now-deleted art station, Sammy described the concept art as being made for a cancelled Zelda project worked on from 2005 to 2008, applying different mediums as well as combinations to explore a wide range of styles. It was a fun pre-pre-pre-production origin story of the Master Sword. Within the bad ending of Ocarina of Time, we were exploring the last male sheiks, after a genocidal ethnic cleansing, journey transforming into the Master Sword, all while the Dark Gerudo were giving their 100-year birth to Ganon. For folks unfamiliar with Zelda's three timelines, Ocarina's bad ending refers to the timeline that occurs if Link is defeated by Ganon. That's when this game would have taken place. By the way, fans often wonder how the Gerudo race continues to exist if there's only one male born every hundred years. Ocarina's script director Toru Osawa answered that question in a Japanese magazine we translated for an upcoming Ura Zelda video on this channel, but it's worth sharing here. He said the Gerudo women marry men from other tribes, and it's not uncommon for them to kidnap men just for that purpose. The children born from these interracial marriages always have features of a pure Gerudo, and as long as men remain captivated by Gerudo's exotic charms, their bloodline will never fade. All the offspring are daughters, except one son born each century. In addition to the Sheikah and Gerudo, Retro's artwork also shows some new variants of old races, like Deku Warriors, as well as the Dark Velu race, which seems to be a corrupted version of the Dragon race from Wind Waker. There's also some brand new races, like this Axolotl-inspired creature, and a few pieces dedicated to steampunky clock kids, including a clock boy and clock girl. Weird, weird, weird stuff is how Sammy described the project. But games in the Zelda universe have very weird stuff. These were exploration and tests to exercise a range of potential art directions. Several population centers can be seen as well, like Horn Town and a connected area called Horn Town Roots. Then the bizarrely imagined Rock Town, like an Impressionist painting, come to life. There's also Lightning Town. Zoom in and you can see some people providing scale and there's flying airships tied to Lightning Town as well. Zoom in on this one and you can see what looks like ships bombing a village. These are, however, early concepts, and there's no guarantee they would have made it into the game. Sammy wrote, Highly experimental concept designs and art direction. Slinging whatever crap at the wall, see what sticks. Nothing more fun than early Blue Sky pre-production. It's fun to see how the game was taking shape, but how serious was Retro about actually making it? When all this artwork went viral in 2020, fans were wondering if it was a real project or if Sammy was all on his own going nuts with a paintbrush. Right after his art was discovered but before he disappeared, Sammy provided a brief statement to IGN. He said, 
I doubt many at Nintendo proper saw much of any of this stuff. I was mostly put into a room like Milton from Office Space and tasked to brainstorm between other projects. We weren't entirely convinced it was a one-man job though. Sammy may have downplayed the situation to cover his retreat. So we contacted everyone who worked at Retro during this time, about 70 people total, all the way down to the accountants and janitor. Almost everyone was either unable or unwilling to talk, but we caught a break when one agreed to share details as an anonymous source. They told us Retro pitched a lot of games over the years, including some that fans have never heard about, even as rumors. And truth is, most pitches never become games. That's just the nature of the industry. So we asked, would it be fair to say the Zelda spin-off was nothing particularly important, that it was never taken too seriously and it was just one of countless ideas that basically went nowhere? They took exception to us suggesting Retro would half-ass a project, especially a huge Nintendo IP. They set us straight. Everything they pitched to Nintendo was taken seriously. Retro had multiple developers supporting even preliminary takes on every project. There was a lot more of the game that was never made public, much more than Sammy's art. Around the same time we were talking to our source, some huge Nintendo leaks happened. A lot of the Nintendo 64 development assets, beta sprites, and more visual aspects soaked up most of the media coverage. But there was also a spreadsheet for internal company use, not meant to be seen by folks like us, with a list of in-development games circa late 2005. One of those games was called Project X, developed by Retro Studios. We went ahead and translated the part around Project X so you can read it. The spreadsheet includes some games that did release, like Mario Party 8 and Battalion Wars 2. Based on outside info, these appear to be Other M and Smash Bros. Brawl, which were also completed. Some of them got cancelled though like the Battalion Wars spin-off Night Wars, and of course, Project X. The spreadsheet says it was gonna be in pre-production at least a few more months, and that it's an action game featuring Sheik from Zelda Ocarina of Time. Some of y'all might be thinking, wait, Sheik? I thought this game was gonna star the last surviving male Sheikah. We were confused on that point for a while ourselves, but what Sammy actually said was it's the origin story of the Master Sword within the bad ending of Ocarina of Time, exploring the last male Sheik's journey transforming into the Master Sword. It's probably safe to assume male Sheik was a typo, and he meant the last male Sheikah, the race Impa hails from. A lot of news sites that reported the story implied he was the playable character, but actually the story focused on the last male Sheikah's transformation into the Master Sword, but the playable character was Sheik. It's worth noting that when Skyward Sword released six years later, it also told the origin story of the Master Sword and how Fee's spirit was laid to rest inside it. That's pretty similar to the plot of Project X, so it seems Nintendo repurposed the idea for their own Wii Zelda. The leaked spreadsheet also identifies who's overseeing production back in Japan. Nintendo Software Planning and Development Production Group 3, headed up by Kensuke Tanabe. NPD Group 3 oversaw development on classic titles like Paper Mario, Thousand Year Door, and Mother 3, as well as games like Mario Strikers Charged, Kirby, and Metroid Prime 2 and 3. Interestingly though, they never touched a Zelda game in their entire history. In other words, we had Retro, a talented developer who'd never worked on Zelda before, being managed by a veteran Nintendo division who'd never overseen a Zelda before. Project X was on the road to becoming something completely different to Zelda games of the past. Our anonymous source told us, We never worked on anything, even pitched anything, that would be similar to Breath of the Wild, Ocarina of Time, or Wind Waker. We never worked on a game of that format. I shouldn't say too much, but we never worked on anything that could be called a traditional Zelda. We were a little confused. Were they trying to deny the game ever existed? What were they saying exactly? I'm just saying we never worked on anything that could be equated to the same type of game as a Zelda, as a Breath of the Wild, and so forth. We never worked on a game in that format. So we asked what the genre was gonna be. Sammy Hall's notes said it was set to be an action JRPG. So was that the twist? That the spin-off was some sort of JRPG? Maybe turn-based? Our source told us no. Retro never planned or even pitched anything that could be considered a JRPG. 
We had a long list of questions, but most of them they'd only give us vague answers to, and he refused to say what made Project X so non-traditional. So we redoubled our efforts to find more team members. It took a few months of emails, LinkedIn connections, contacting the same people that ignored us the first time, etc, etc. We'll spare you the details, but long story short, we finally got in touch with one of Project X's programmers who was willing to speak on the record. That someone was Paul Tozur, who was also a programmer on Metroid Prime 2 and 3. He answered every question our anonymous source wouldn't. I see people, you know, commenting on that concept art on the internet and being like, oh my god, Retro was working on a Zelda game, that would have been so awesome. And, and like, I understand that feeling, but what they have to understand is it was not actually a Zelda game. At no point was it anything like, really anything like Zelda. It was uh, an experiment gone wrong that happened to be set in the Zelda universe. So what was the gameplay actually like? Paul said it was badly undercooked, like a simplified version of Whack-A-Mole. He was in charge of coding the combat, which he describes as Sheik standing in one place unable to move, surrounded by a group of enemy wolves, which by the way is why there's so much wolf concept art, and they jump at you one at a time, and you just flick the Wiimote to kill them. There were four or five wolves, maybe six, and they would just be in their idle state waiting to pounce at you. Then they'd jump one by one and you'd go whack. So that's literally all it was, just detecting when the player swung the Wii remote. If so, the wolf dies, and if you don't do it correctly, you take damage. You know, for me it comes back to that famous Sid Meier quote, a game is a series of interesting decisions. So I compare that gameplay to Whack-A-Mole, but the problem is there's actually fewer decisions involved than Whack-A-Mole. Because with Whack-A-Mole, you've got all these moles popping up, and you've got to prioritize which one do I hit, which ones do I ignore, which order am I going to whack these moles in. There's actually some thinking involved, whereas with Sheik, it's pure stimulus response. So if you don't have that level of interesting decision making, you don't really have gameplay. He went on to say that the only enemies in the prototype were wolves, but the plan was to add more enemy types if it went into full production. To be clear, Paul was just programming what he was told to program. He didn't get to decide how the combat actually worked. That was dictated by Sheik's designers. That was another code name, by the way. They called the game Sheik. But when Paul went to one of the designers and voiced his concerns, the designer said this sort of super simplified gameplay was the wave of the future and compared it to Link's crossbow training. The other programmer, Rice Lewis, was in charge of the overworld traversal, which was completely separate from the combat. Sheik moved around the overworld, then when she got to a point of interest, she was kind of sucked out of the overworld and into the fight like how it works in a JRPG. As for the overworld traversal itself, Paul says it was even messier than the combat. He called it, quote, a hot mess. We were kind of in disbelief. Are you sure this is the same game? The artwork is awesome. How could the gameplay be so basic? The art was never the problem, Paul told us. The art was great, and there was never any question that Retro's artists could make anything look brilliant. It was the gameplay design that was badly underdeveloped, and wasn't reviewed by Retro's other designers, like the ones working on the Prime Trilogy collection. After a while, Paul went to one of his bosses and said, Hey, why are we doing this? There's no gameplay here. We could do something like Shadow of the Colossus. I know all of us love that game. Why don't we have something where you're fighting huge monsters and you're actually crawling around on their surface? Nintendo's never done anything quite like that before. And he replied, yeah, that would be cool. But he also refused to change the direction we were heading. There were a lot of Shadow of the Colossus fans at Retro. Two of them, Andy O'Neill and Marco Thrush, left Retro to create their own studio, Bluepoint Games, and literally remade Shadow of the Colossus for PlayStation 4. That game's currently got a 91% on Metacritic, by the way. Even Eiji Aonuma, the director and producer of the mainline Zelda series, is a big fan of Shadow of the Colossus. In 2007, he told German magazine Endzone that it was currently his favorite game made outside Nintendo. A Zelda game in that format would have had a lot of potential, or even just a traditional Zelda developed by Retro Studios. But the problem, according to Paul, was Retro's leadership. Whenever anyone put their hand up to say Project X was headed off a cliff, they were ignored. 
Leadership thought they weren't being team players and they should just put their heads down and do their jobs. But Paul points out that part of being a team player is being willing to say, hey, there's an iceberg, we need to turn the ship right away, and not just blindly follow orders. But unfortunately, those warnings fell on deaf ears, and development continued in the same direction. Pre-pre-pre-production, as Sammy put it, started in 2005. Then, after Nintendo greenlit the project in mid-2007, Paul and some others were brought on for actual pre-production, which lasted nine months, up until the prototype was pitched to Nintendo. So how did the pitch go? Paul told us, Nintendo couldn't really make heads or tails of it. Their reaction basically boils down to, this is seriously what you're proposing? Really? It was immediately rejected. That's what I was told, but I wasn't there when it happened. And I suppose there's a possibility it never actually happened and they decided not to show it to Nintendo. Nintendo gave us the green light to make the prototype, but they had zero input or visibility during the nine months of pre-production, which is one of the reasons it failed. Two weeks later, Paul resigned from his position at Retro Studios. Our anonymous source suggested, in his vague way of answering questions, that the decision to cancel Project X might have also been influenced by Retro's top three developers, Mark Piccini, Todd Keller, and Jack Matthews, leaving Retro to start their own company, Armature Studio. They left the same week as the pitch, although we heard conflicting reports whether their departure or the failed pitch happened first. How much talent was working on Project X? Well, one of the guys who left, Mark Piccini, was the design lead. He'd also been the director of all the Metroid Prime games. Todd Keller left too. He was the lead artist and art director on the Prime games, and he was leading the artwork on this project as well. Sammy Hall was working under Todd along with some other artists, although Paul can't remember who they all were. Vince Jolie was the animation lead, the same guy who led animation for Prime 3. There was one more designer, but Paul didn't want to identify him, and Paul and Rice Lewis were the two programmers. In total, there were at least seven people working on this project, but probably a few more Paul can't remember. Paul says many on the team, including himself, thought Project X needed more programmers. Retro had about a dozen more, but they were assigned to other tasks, like the Metroid Prime Trilogy Collection and another prototype called the Blog Game. But he reiterated that regardless of how many programmers they had, X could have only been saved with fundamental design changes. There was a lot of top talent working on the project. The potential was huge. It could have been an awesome game, or who knows, maybe a whole side series, but the design wasn't up to snuff, and retro leadership refused to change direction. As for why, we don't really want to point fingers and name names. Stirring up hate mobs on Twitter isn't really what this channel is about, and our sources don't want that either. So to put it simply, it was just office momentum, and the higher-ups not wanting to listen to the lower-level guys in the trenches. They just wanted them to do their jobs. After three years of work, the project was cancelled in April 2008. Paul said, Rice and I tried to point out that we were headed toward an iceberg, but we were met with a lot of resistance and eventually found ourselves sliding down the deck into the icy waters of the Atlantic. Maybe this whole messy story is why everyone we talked to was so hush-hush about the project, and why a few years later, Miyamoto said if Retro was going to make a Zelda game, he'd probably need to move to Texas to oversee its development. For the record, after we talked to Paul, we reached out to everyone mentioned in this video one more time to see if they wanted to provide comment or offer an alternate perspective. They all declined or ignored our correspondence. And finally, the big question. Whatever happened to the prototype, the artwork made by all other artists, and the design documents? Paul never kept any of it to himself. He was immensely proud of a lot of the projects he worked on at Retro over the years, but not this one. He's spent the last 15 years trying to forget about Project X, not preserving it. Who knows, maybe it's all sitting on a thumb drive in Retro's basement, never to be seen again. But we've got some potential good news for folks who'd love to see a good sheet game someday. And also, the special surprise we alluded to earlier. First, the good news, which is that Nintendo's still considering a Sheik spin-off. Right after Breath of the Wild's first trailer dropped in 2014, a vague statement from Eiji Aonuma led to rumors that Link was gonna be female, or that players would have the option to choose Link's gender. Aonuma later clarified it was just a joke, and Link was still very much a dude. 
But then a couple years later at E3 2016, Aonuma said the Zelda team actually did consider having a woman playable after fans reacted positively to those rumors, but they decided Zelda would make more sense as a playable character than a gender-swapped Link. But the idea was ultimately rejected because if Zelda is off saving Hyrule, Link wouldn't really have a purpose. Shigeru Miyamoto was at E3 too, so the next day Game Rant asked him to expound on that idea. He said, Some people might wonder, you know, because the title is Zelda, it's a female character. Why isn't the protagonist a female character? But really, to me, The Legend of Zelda, the main series, Link is the protagonist. And here's the important part. But within the development team too, there have been talks about how it might be cool to have a game that features Sheik as a protagonist. It's having maybe a Zelda spin-off with Sheik as a protagonist, for example. I, I don't think that's an impossibility. A Zelda spin-off starring Sheik as the protagonist sure sounds a lot like Project X, but you know, with better gameplay presumably. And since the Master Sword origin story already got used in Skyward Sword, it would need a new story as well. Miyamoto said the Zelda team's been talking about it, but that doesn't necessarily mean they'd make it themselves. Nintendo's lent out the Zelda IP to quite a few outside studios over the years. Capcom made the Oracle and Four Swords games, Grezzo handled a lot of remakes including Link's Awakening, and uh, the Philips CDI trilogy. And Brace Yourself Games made the recent Cadence of Hyrule spin-off. Most of the guys who worked on Project X already left Retro a long time ago, so there's no chance it could ever get made by the original team. But whether it's Nintendo themselves or one of their partners, there's still a chance Sheik will get the spin-off series she deserves. Okay, and now for the surprise. While we were spending the last year chasing down old retro devs trying to get the story on Project X, we came into possession of another Zelda spin-off that Retro pitched to Nintendo. Yes, another retro Zelda. It was called Heroes of Hyrule. Much of the story focuses on three heroes, a Goron, a Zora, and a Rito who lived 100 years in the past. Kinda sounds like Breath of the Wild, doesn't it? But there's one big difference. Instead of staying forever young in the Shrine of Resurrection, in this game, Link's aged into an old man. There's a heck of a lot more to talk about, but that's where we'll leave it for now. Heroes of Hyrule really deserves its own video. We're already working on it and it'll be up on this channel in a few weeks. Subscribe if you don't want to miss it.